My name is Jeremy Balenson. I'm a professor at Stanford University. In 1999, I got my PhD doing low-level artificial intelligence. I'd run experiments on humans to figure out how the brain made decisions, how you formed categories, how you did reasoning, and I'd build low-level AI to try to model how the brain thought. And in 1999, I decided to drastically shift my field. I left cognitive science, and then I got a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara, where I learned how to build the hardware to do VR tracking. I learned how to code the content for VR. But I shifted to a social psychology lab where, in addition to building VR, I learned how to test bigger questions, not just how the brain works, but how do people communicate? How does training work? How can you change education? What does social interaction look like inside of virtual reality? And I did that for four years, and in 2003, I was lucky enough to get a job at Stanford University, where for 15 years, I've been building VR, running experiments where I put humans in VR, see how it affects the mind, and more recently, building applications to leverage what we know about what makes VR such a powerful medium. So I'm going to take you back in time to the year 2001. In 2001, my colleagues and I flew from Santa Barbara to Washington, D.C., and we gave a demonstration to the Federal Judicial Center on how one would use virtual reality in the courtroom. For example, recreating crime scenes so that jurors could look around or having witnesses do police lineups where they got to look at suspects. And while we were there, we showed our classic demo, the classic demo that really shows you that VR feels real. And this is called walking the plank. And the way that this works is you put on the goggles, and you look around, and you're in a VR version of the room that you're in. That's kind of boring. So you're there, and you kind of walk a little bit, and everything feels right, and you're in this room. We then hit a button, and we drop a chasm. Chasm is about 10 meters deep. And to get across, you've got to walk across a little rickety plank to get the three meters to get to the other side. So we're giving these demos, and they're very powerful. And we had a federal judge come through. Uh, and the federal judge is kind of a big guy and a lot of gravitas. And while he was walking, he just made a mistake, and he stepped a little bit to his left. So we're tracking his body movements. And of course, we model gravity. And so what his eyes tell him and what his ears are telling him is that as he steps off, he's falling to the bottom of this plank, to the bottom of the pit. Now, if you were in the real world and you wanted to save your life, the only solution would be to dive at a 45-degree angle to try to catch the lip of that edge. And so here we are in Washington, D.C., with a room full of judges and lawyers, and this federal judge just dives in the middle of the air. Okay. It gets a little bit worse. It was my first public demo. And there was a table uh, where the render machine was, and it had a sharp corner on it, OK? And so this judge's face is going right towards the corner. And I was a 26-year-old postdoc. I had one move, because I wasn't prepared for this event. My one move was to just kind of smash into him, redirect his trajectory so his face didn't hit the, the corner. And so uh, he was fine. Nobody got sued or put in jail. He was actually a pretty good sport about it. But the reason why I spend a minute of your time on that story is to illustrate something called presence. Presence is the construct that really makes VR special. Psychologists define it as the illusion of non-mediation, meaning when VR is done well, the technology disappears. You're having an experience. The front of your brain may be telling you it's not real, but the back of your brain, the part that's in charge of keeping you alive, cannot overcome the illusion. Another way to think about it is we just learned about biology and how long it takes. Evolution takes a while, and VR is a really new thing. So the brain just kind of uses its template, and we respond as if it's real. My lab at Stanford has been around for 15 years. Uh, we are, have been very active in guiding decision makers during that time. We have heads of state that come to the lab. We have the US military spends a bunch of time there. We have CEOs of big companies. We've got a floor that shakes. We've got a very accurate tracking system that can measure your body movements really accurately. We do virtual scent. Uh, it's a very high-end technical destination. That being said, the lab as a technological destination is completely obsolete at this point. Meaning, we've gone from when I first started doing this work, every VR system that we ever used in my lab up until about five years ago cost more than my automobile. We've now gone from them costing more than a car to they cost a couple hundred dollars. And for the first time ever in the long history of VR, which has really been around conceptually since the 60s, but in practice since the, the early 80s, We've got tens of millions of these things floating around, a lot of these really great high-end systems. Now, 
this is Popper. Popper was 90 years old in this picture. And for those of you who are watching this, what's going through your mind right now, if you've tried virtual reality, is just what Popper experienced, which is he did VR, and he said, wow, this is cool, but, but really, what's the point? And, and what am I going to use this for? And I, I, that's a common narrative that we see in the Valley, which is really cool technology. I don't see how it's going to affect my life. And what we're going to talk about for the rest of today are applications that justify when one would use VR. And uh, a framework that we like to talk about is the DICE framework. And what the DICE framework says, if you're going to use virtual reality, you should save it for an experience that if you did it in the real world, it would be dangerous. For example, flight simulator, making mistakes while learning to fly is very dangerous. Impossible, for example, becoming someone else, changing your skin color, changing your age, changing your gender, and experiencing diversity training. Counterproductive, you learn such an important lesson in this virtual reality experience, but if you did it in the real world, it would come at a cost to you. Or things that are just so prohibitively expensive and rare that you just can't do them easily in the real world. Another way of saying this is uh, if three years from now all of you are putting on virtual reality goggles to check your email, then I've done something horribly wrong as an evangelist in this space. It's not for that. I'm showing a copy of my book not because I'm asking you to buy it. Uh, Samsung has been generous enough to give all of you a copy. And uh, for those of you that really care about the notions I'm going to talk about today, uh, please enjoy reading it. In particular, chapters 1, 3, and 10 are most relevant to today's topics. First thing I want to talk about is a line of research that we've been doing for quite some time, and it's really about empathy uh, and how one can generate empathy. And we're going to talk about two separate psychological theories that give rise to this work. The first one is called the contact hypothesis. To oversimplify a psychological and sociological theory, if you take groups that don't get along well, where one's an in-group and one's an out-group, or they just don't have much time spent together, and there's some tension there, Simply by putting them together, putting people in the same schools, for example, that physical contact will eventually cause people to have better social relations. Very famous theory started in the 1960s. Second theory I want to talk about is something called body transfer. And what body transfer states, this is a neuroscience theory. If you are moving your body physically and you have what's called an avatar, a digital representation of yourself, and that avatar moves with you synchronously, meaning at the same time as you, after about four minutes, the part of your brain that represents the self, the part of the brain that activates uh, when you think about yourself or see yourself, it expands to include this external representation. In other words, the avatar becomes part of the self psychologically. I'm going to show a movie that's very old, so be kind to my graphics. This is from the year 2003. And this is a demonstration of the type of work we do to study how one would use this technology. So this is Nick Yee, uh, the genius that did, did a lot of this early work. He walks up to a virtual mirror. He does it for four minutes. You're only going to see it for 10 seconds. He's moving his body. His avatar moves with him. And after about four minutes, it really feels like it's you. He bends down. We hit a button, and he goes from a white male to a woman of color. Okay? And when he comes up, this reaction that people have is very intense. You feel as if you've changed into a different person. The next step in the typical experiment is we network in a second person, and that second person proceeds to treat you horribly based on your, ge your gender, or your race, or your body size, or your age. And you experience firsthand, you walk a mile in someone's shoes, and while wearing their body, you experience really intense prejudice. Chapter three of the book summarizes a lot of the research that's been done to date. And, and let me just kind of give you a, a high level view. VR is not a magic solution that solves all the world's problems. It doesn't solve racism, it doesn't solve sexism. However, it's a tool that across all the studies that have been done, compared to control conditions like role playing or reading about case studies or all the things we do in a corporate diversity training context, compared to those control conditions, it outperforms in changing people's behavior later on. Let me give you an example. Here is a piece uh, called Thousand Cut Journey. Uh, this is the genius of a woman named Courtney Cogburn. She's a professor at Columbia that studies black-white racism in her day job. Uh, she, her lab and my lab have teamed up to produce about a 10-minute experience where uh, you become a black male, 
you body transfer into him, uh, and you experience implicit racial bias as a child. So you're in your uh, elementary school class, and the teacher punishes you for something that other kids have done. Then uh, with the screenshot you're seeing here, you become a teenager, and you're dealing with a stop and frisk situation, again, based on something you didn't do. The third scene, you uh, are now 30 years old, and you're a Yale graduate, and you walk into an interview situation, and the interviewer just doesn't even see you. He doesn't even know that you're there, and eventually he gets around to you, but he couldn't even imagine that you were the candidate for the job. All based on Courtney's academic research. Of course, we study this academically, showing how it changes uh, the way that you uh, think about people of other races, but more importantly, in this age of affordable VR, we can port it outward. And so Courtney's done a brilliant job of working with dozens of companies now that are installing this as part of their diversity training curriculum. And it's just a transformational experience that causes everything to change compared to just doing it when you're reading these case studies. It's a, it's, it's a fundamental difference. A graduate student in my lab, her name is Fernanda Herrera. Fernanda has produced the most amazing study to kind of give us an understanding of how robust these effects are. So Fernanda studied a piece called Becoming Homeless. Becoming Homeless is free to download online if you'd like it. It's based on the research of psychologist Lee Ross. Lee Ross has coined something called the fundamental attribution error. And what the fundamental attribution error states is that when something bad happens to me, I blame the situation. When something bad happens to you, I blame something about who you are, your character, and all of us do this all the time. We assume that bad people deserve the stuff that we, you get. So we've built something called Becoming Homeless where you learn that not all homelessness is caused by who a person is. Situational factors get in the way. So in this simulation, you get evicted from your house. You're trying to sell stuff uh, to make rent, but you can't sell stuff quickly enough to make your rent, so your landlord throws you out. You're then trying to live in your car, uh, and it's really crowded and gross in there, but it's illegal to do that, so the uh, police roust you from your car. You try to sleep on a bus, which is what a lot of homeless people do, but there's a man there who's harassing you while you're trying to sleep, and you get a sense for how intense and uncomfortable that homelessness can be, and it's all forced by situation. So what Fernanda's done is she studied the long-term efficacy of this. So she did an amazing job where she got a large sample of thousands of people who went through this or a control condition, and she looked two months later. And two months after having a VR experience, compared to, say, uh, reading about a case study or doing kind of corporate role playing about this, when you do the VR study, you are more likely to sign a petition, an actual California proposition that says, I am willing to have my own personal taxes increased to support affordable housing measures. So in general, we look at behaviors, and this is the first study. Again, I, I would never want to create the impression that VR solves all the problems, but this is the first study that shows these effects last two months out, and they last with real behaviors, signing petitions like that. So I want to shift to conservation. Uh, one of my academic heroes is Dr. Jane Lubchenco. Uh, Dr. Lubchenco was the head of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration under President Obama for four years. In that four-year window, she saw more natural disaster, uh, extreme weather events that occurred in any four-year window in US history. Of course, this is due to climate change. Um, but as her job, uh, her, one of the things she had to do is when these horrible disasters occurs, drought or flooding, she would fly there to help the people out. And she tells a story about going to a district that where the lawmaker there, he was an intense climate change denier, uh, but he just had a really intense weather event happen. And she got off of the helicopter and he comes up to her and says, Jane, Jane, I believe you now. I am a believer. I've seen the light. This is an exact quote that she recounts from him, meaning a climate change denier became a climate change advocate, or at least a tolerating the notion that climate change was produced by, US, uh, by human activity because of an extreme weather event. In virtual reality, disaster is free. I can hit a button and cause a flood or a, uh, all sorts of these uh, extreme wildfires. And for 15 years, we've, what we've been doing is building simulations that put someone in a horrible future where climate change has made your hometown uh, a place where one can't live, and then showing how behaviorally that changes. Are you more likely to recycle? Are you going to donate to pro-environmental causes? Things of that nature. What I want to focus on today is a piece called the Stanford Ocean Acidification Experience. This is an eight-minute field trip where you put on the goggles, 
You become Dr. Phil McKelly, who is a genius at Stanford. She studies ocean acidification, and you learn about how uh, the oceans are going to be devastated by the intake of CO2 and how there's not going to be a food web or fish to eat uh, 75 years from now. Uh, but you do it by becoming a scientist. And uh, we've done a lot of things with this. The first thing we've done is we've studied it in high school classrooms. We've studied it in adult learning contexts. People learn about marine science from this. The second thing that we've done is that we have brought it to lawmakers. We've given briefing at the U.S. Senate. Uh, we've had senators and congresswomen and congressmen go through here using this as a tool to give them a visceral experience about how humans are causing climate change and what that impact will be. Most importantly, we've made this free online. So if you go to some, a website called Steam or Viveport or Oculus Experience, this is free for anyone to download. And I checked this morning, as of today, 102 countries have downloaded and installed this. That's over half the planet. And it allows us to export these amazing field trips, this constructivist learning, at a scale that you can't do otherwise. So it's a, it's a really neat way to help people understand this calamity by giving them a direct experience. I want to shift now to talk the story of Derek Belch. So Derek took my virtual people class in 2005. At the end of the class, he said, Jeremy, he was a field goal kicker for the Stanford football team. He said, Jeremy, can we use virtual reality to train athletes? I said, Derek, it's a brilliant idea. How about you come back in about 10 years when the technology is ready? And so Derek did. He came back in 2013, and he got his master's thesis in my lab while he was also an assistant coach on the Stanford football team. And he convinced Coach David Shaw, who's a genius, a brilliant, brilliant forward-thinking individual, Coach Shaw donated five minutes of practice time on Mondays where we would build a virtual reality scenario of our team pretending to be the team we're going to play that Saturday and throw out a bunch of complicated blitz packages and we would film in VR what it was going to be like to play the team we were playing Saturday. Then on Wednesday, we'd get that footage back to the football office and the quarterback, he would train. And when I say he would train, he knows how to throw and run. We're not teaching that. We're teaching them how to make decisions. And the way we're doing that, when a quarterback goes to the line of scrimmage, he basically has a line of plays and he looks around and everybody's running around trying to confuse him and screaming at him and he's got to make a choice. Do I keep the original play, that's called let it roll, or do I go to the next play down the queue, which is called kill, kill, kill. He can also move a running back to pick up a blocker. Those are the two parameters he's got to do while everyone's screaming at him trying to fake him. And so we had them train mental decision making, extra repetitions of looking around, feeling the cacophony and deciding what to do. After three weeks, coach makes it mandatory for all the players to use. At the end of that season, Stanford football outperforms expectations. Both the coach as well as Kevin Hogan, uh, the quarterback that year, say that VR was one of the reasons why they did so well. So Derek graduates January 2nd, uh, and like many Stanford students, on January 3rd, he forms a startup. Uh, startup is called Striver, and Striver, I'm a co-founder for full disclosure. Derek just blows everyone away. Within three months, he signed seven NFL teams to multi-year packages, and in the next few years, proceeds to change the way sports are trained. Uh, I can't list all the teams that we're working with, but I want you to focus on the leagues. Every major league is using this now to train referees, work with the United States Olympic team, changing the way people mentally prepare for sports. But then we have an interesting thing happen. One of the teams that we train is the Arkansas Razorbacks. And uh, we're training the Razorbacks. We've got this beautiful VR system set up uh, in the football office. And Brock, who's in charge of training for Walmart, comes in and he does the football demo. And he says, huh, what you guys are doing, which is have someone look around, recognize the visual pattern, make a decision based on what he sees, and then tell other people about it is what every Walmart employee does every day. And so we began a journey. And the journey began at one single, of, one, single one of Walmart's 200 training academies. They've got these training academies, boot camps where you go to learn. You may be asking, what would one do in virtual reality uh, to train for Walmart? And I will tell you, um, the pit, which is super scary, and we brought it for you in the demo room, by the way. So after this, while you're having your wine later on, go try to walk the plank. That's super scary, uh, but to me, the scariest thing I've ever done is holiday rush at Walmart. Okay, you've got people everywhere coming at you, screaming at you, and it's a rare event due to turnover at Walmart. Only one in two employees have ever gone through it. So we have about 20 scenarios, a difficult conversation with an employee, uh, how to fire somebody, uh, how to hire somebody, uh, lots of these scenarios. 
So we start at one training academy, and we just show qualitatively it's well-received, people like it. We then go to 30 of them, and over uh, you know, a, a trial period, we train you know, a couple ten, about 10 to 20,000 people, and in 30 of them, we compare it to 30 other training academies that don't have VR, and look at their subsequent job performance and show that people trained in VR do better than those who did not subsequently on their job. We then go to all 200 training academies, and um, in the year 2016, 2017, 200,000 Walmart employees train in VR. Uh, then this happens. Oop. Walmart decides to install two, three, or four VR training systems in every single one of its 4,700 stores. We installed 17,000 VR training systems across the United States in the largest rollout in the history of VR. As of now, we have this year, in the past year, we've had one million Walmart employees trained in VR. It is truly the moment when VR migrates out to the world. It's not just quarterbacks or military folks who are doing this. It's people that get to do this every day to make their jobs better. And it's a very special moment in the history of VR. A harder to tell story is uh, one of the things that we're training Walmart employees to do is how to survive an active shooter situation and how to keep their customers safe. Um, one of the things that we've been working with them for a year on is active shooter training and the people who were in that store in El Paso that day actually were trained on how to deal with active shooter. And this is a screenshot of an interview that Doug McMillan, the CEO of Walmart, gave to Fortune magazine saying that as horrible as that event was, more lives would have been lost if people weren't very quick at making decisions. Um, and so for these intense events, it's not fun to talk about, but I think this is an important tool for training. Verizon uh, has adopted a similar approach. Uh, we've worked with uh, thousands of, of Verizon store managers to train them on how to save lives when a gunman comes into their stores. They've got all the merchandise up front in the store. Uh, it's a really nice use case. United Rentals has reduced the onboarding of salespeople by 50%. Tyson claims with their internal data, this is them saying that Accidents on the job have gone down by 20% since they've started using Striver for training. Uh, nationwide has taken a three hour long training regimen that nobody liked to do and condense it into 12 minutes uh, and they love it. I'm gonna close on the Niners. I hope some of you are Niners fans. Uh, we're eight and zero this year. We're eight and zero this year. And um, we are using Striver for training. So root for the Niners this Sunday and thank you very much for your attention.